So welcome to the latest in the uh, Pages 2K seminar series that we've been running this year. Uh, we're delighted today to be joined by two speakers, uh, Nathan Steiger and Jason Smyrna. And today's seminar is going to be taking uh, a deep dive into the world of data assimilation, uh, which clearly is an emerging technique in the world of paleoclimate but not just data assimilation, the application of data assimilation to reconstruct and study paleoclimate, which is uh, very topical given the uh, proposal that we're currently preparing for phase four of the PAGES 2K network. So the format for today's seminar, uh, Nathan will speak first, followed by Jason. Uh, while they're talking, uh, please type your questions into the uh, the chat window while they're talking and then at the end we'll curate the questions and have a discussion and q a session based around your questions so i like to keep intro short so we'll move over to the first of today's speakers so nathan steigers a senior lecturer at the hebrew university of jerusalem and an associate research scientist at lamont doherty Earth University at Columbia University. He majored in physics, doing thesis work in theoretical quantum mechanics before performing work uh, in graduate school on developing new methods for reconstructing past climate using data assimilation. He received his PhD in atmospheric sciences in 2015 before coming up to uh, Columbia University as a NOAA climate and Global Ch Climate Postdoctoral Fellow. And since last year, he's been appointed at both Columbia University and Hebrew University. So over to you, please, Nathan. Great, thank you. All right, share screen. Okay. Um, All right, so basically uh, the talks that Jason and I are going to give today split into two. So I'll cover basically how we constructed what we call FIDA, uh, which is a data assimilation product. And then Jason will talk about a couple of applications that we've had uh, using FIDA. So basically it's motivated uh, our work is really motivated by two fundamental facts or questions or issues. Um, and it's really related to how we do traditionally how paleoclimate has been done. So basically, if you have paleoclimate data, if you just have that, it usually can't tell you why you see the changes that you see. So for example, to take a, a, a very prominent example in the field of hydroclimate, paleohydroclimate. This is uh, Scott Stein's paper from 1994, where he, he basically outlined evidence for extreme droughts, what we now call mega droughts that occurred in California and in Patagonia, at least he found evidence for them in, in both locations. Um, and in this study, he had a lot of geological evidence, mostly based on relic tree stumps in various locations in California. Uh, to come to the conclusion that there were these severe droughts. And at the end, he has um, a plausible dynamical explanation that he tries to kind of offer, but he doesn't have really any evidence for that dynamical explanation. And that's, that's a quite common feature in a lot of paleoclimate. You can see that there was a change, but you can't explain why. Uh, and then if we look um, beyond that, we look at, at uh, climate field reconstructions um, uh, using, for example, the North American Drought Atlas. This is uh, one uh, avenue of application. You can, you can understand why there were, you can understand when there were droughts and you can connect them to say to, um, to events that happened in the past, the, uh, the destruction or the abandonment of uh, cities, cliff dwellings in, uh, in the, the American Southwest. Uh, but again, there's no, um, there's no explanation of why these droughts happened uh, within these products. So it gives you a nice spatial uh, image, but without the, the why. The, what are the dynamics that would cause this? 
Relatedly, uh, the other approach, the other dominant approach in studying paleoclimate is to use simula simulations. And those simulations, they can tell you why something happened, but they can't actually, uh, it's not really what actually happened. So uh, a model simulation can be forced with the most realistic forcings, but it's not really intended to be exactly what happened. It's, it's intended to be representative of what could have happened in the past. So this is an example from a prominent simulation called the trace simulation from uh, the past, gla uh, the last glacial maximum to the present. And, um, but this is uh, many, many simulations have been done for paleoclimate. I'm sure many of you have used them or even created them yourselves. And uh, these are really two, when we contrast this with, with the data only approach, these are the two dominant ways of doing paleoclimate. And so what data simulation is, is basically a fusing of these two approaches. So data simulation fundamentally is about combining a model with the proxies. And so what we then hope to get from that is what the whole climate system was actually like. So we get what the climate system is like from the model, we get the, the time history from the proxies. And when we do the data simulation, we're using error estimates in both. So we're not treating either one as the truth. So we understand that models are imperfect. We understand that proxies are imperfect. And so we're using a statistical framework that will take account of both of those issues. So I'm gonna step through basically the fundamental equation of data assimilation, the ensemble common filter. There are other ways of doing data assimilation, uh, but I'll describe this as, as the one that I use and that's most commonly used for paleoclimate. So fundamentally we're fusing models with proxies to try to figure out why climate did what it did. So imagine a situation where we have um, a model. So this model gives us an ensemble estimate of what could happen in a particular year. So this is our initial guess. And so in the data simulation world, we use uh, XB, we call this XB or our background or our prior. And this is a, a very large vector here for this cartoon example. It's temperature at a particular grid box. And we have some initial ensemble guess. And the spread that we have in this guess represents uh, the amount of uncertainty uh, or, or rather the, the range of possible values that we are allowing uh, for our initial guess. We also have proxies that we're going to want to combine. And so we represent this with Y. And so the proxies uh, aren't, will not necessarily be the same as our initial uh, guess. And we use this equation then to combine them and I'll step through each part. So this HXB component is what we call uh, our model estimate of the proxies or observations. This is the proxy system model. So those of you who work on proxy system models, this is where we use them within the data simulation framework. So the basic idea is that you need to go from model variables, so temperature, precipitation, whatever, into the space of the proxy. So you need to effectively grow a tree ring or you need to grow a coral, or you need to uh, get the isotopes out of, say, a, a model. You need to go from the precipitation to, to the water isotopes at the location where you have the ice cores. And so this is where we're going from all those model variables into the space of the proxies so that we can then uh, do the, the math here where we, uh, where we subtract the two. There's a weighting factor called the common gain, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, a little bit later on, but this is a really important factor in this uh, equation. And it's, uh, you can think of it as a weighting function, uh, a spatial weighting function. And then when you compute this equation, you get out our analysis or your posterior estimate. So if we go back now down to our little cartoon here, we have our initial guess, we have the proxies, we compute this equation and we get a new ensemble probabilistic estimate out of that. And so this is uh, for a particular year. And then what we do is we move forward in time. So if we do to the next year, so if we're assuming that this is annual data assimilation, then this is one year and then followed by a second year. Um, and so in this particular case, there's wide uncertainty that we have in our proxies and that gets reflected in the answer that we get. There's more spread in, in our answer. 
And then uh, contrary to that, if we have very low uncertainty in our proxies, then that will also be reflected in the answer that we get. Um, and that's the, the fundamental process. I should mention that this equation, the Kalman filter, is a, really a general equation and it's applied in a very wide range of circumstances. It was first invented and used by NASA for guiding their, uh, their spaceships out in space. Um, but it, it's very, very widely used by engineers and scientists across a very wide uh, set of disciplines. Okay, so now let's try to look at how this works in a spatial context. So we're gonna be looking at how the ensemble mean changes after we assimilate proxies. So we have uh, our initial estimate like we had in the, the previous cartoon and we'll have an ensemble mean. So it's, it's hard to represent uh, a full ensemble in a spatial uh, context, but we can do the mean in spatially pretty easily. So I'll be showing that. So this is the basic idea. We have our initial uh, ensemble estimate. We're going to assimilate one proxy at a time to show you the effects of that. Uh, and then we get a new estimate that has a new mean. And so we'll see that uh, on these next slides, we'll see how that assimilating proxies changes the spatial ensemble mean. So if we assimilate a proxy, so here, this is the impact of assimilating a one particular proxy in North America. This is um, a, uh, not a, a real uh, reconstruction, but one that that is uh, what we call pseudo proxy reconstruction, but it's illustrative of the process that happens. So in this particular year, I've assimilated here one proxy uh, over North America. It's made um, the, the area around it colder, but it's made the Central Pacific a little bit warmer. And so this is able to do this. So when we do the reconstruction, it not only does it impact right where you have the proxy, but it also, has an impact over a very large area. And that area depends on the covariance structure of the model. So that's basically how are other points within the globe related to each other. We know that the climate or even weather, um, if you know information in one location, it can actually tell you about many other locations. And so you, when you're doing data assimilation, you rely on the model's covariance structure to spread that information around. To other locations. So that's why we can assimilate a proxy here in North America and get information that impacts elsewhere. And this is fundamentally, uh, if we go back to that data assimilation equation, this is the, the, uh, the K, the common gain uh, that's doing this, that's spreading this information around. So let's look uh, what happens when we assimilate new proxies. And so I'll represent new proxies with a filled in green square and previously assimilated proxies with an open square here. And so this second proxy had a bigger impact, uh, but we can assimilate even more, third, fourth, um, fifth, and this will, um, in this uh, kind of brief animation, will, will hammer out the answer. So each proxy, depending on where it is, depending on the covariance structure, depending on its uncertainties, uh, will impact the reconstruction in a different way. So the basic idea is that when you're assimilating all of these proxies, each of them uh, hammers out the answer uh, until we get to um, a, an optimal solution to the, the question of, okay, we have this information we, uh, from proxies and we also have this information from models. We have their uncertainties. What's the best estimate of what climate was doing uh, in that particular year in this, in this case? So uh, for this uh, little example, I happen to, chose, happen to choose a volcanic eruption year. So it's going to get cold. So we'll just kind of skip to the end here. And we can see that all these, these proxies they made uh, that year particularly cold. It was a volcanic eruption year. So in practice, uh, when I actually do the data simulation, I reconstruct, uh, use, um, it happens all at once. So for every year, we assimilate all the proxies, all the locations, all the climate variables that all happen simultaneously. So I don't actually step through one at a time, but happens simultaneously. Okay, so one really important point to keep in mind. So the um, data summation is really great that we can get all of these variables, but it's really important to know as a user of data simulation products that not all variables are equal. So 
uh, for example, in pseudo proxy experiments uh, that, I, that I've done and um, real uh, experiments that others have done, um, you can actually show that precipitation is, is in general poorly reconstructed um, compared to, uh, to other climate variables. And you can, uh, in a paper that I worked on, even if you have perfect ice cores, um, it's very, very hard to reconstruct it. So why is that the case? So in this particular case, what I'm showing here is correlation link scale for um, ice cores and how they are correlate with, with other variables. So two meter temperature and geopotential height of 500 hectopascals, that's C500 and also precipitation. So fundamentally, there are certain variables like precipitation that just have very short correlation length scales. And so what that means is that if you have observations, um, it's just not, uh, if you say you have an ice core, it's just not going to have very much information uh, about uh, precipitation that's going to spread uh, nearby. So it's, it's much easier to spread that information if we're talking about temperature or geopotential height other variables like precipitation are much harder uh, to do. And it's very hard to get a skillful reconstruction of precipitation because those correlation length scales are just so short. That information just doesn't spread very far. So that's really important to keep in mind uh, as a user of these products. They're not all created equal. Some variables are just gonna be better reconstructed for fundamental climate reasons. Okay, so what are some of the details of FIDA or what we call a paleohydrodynamic data simulation product? So it's a probabilistic reconstruction, kind of like how I showed you in the cartoon example. So we have uh, an ensemble estimate of what we reconstruct. And uh, we have spatial variables, including temperature, PDSI, and SPEI. So PDSI and SPEI are two hydroclimate variables that are very commonly used. We also have dynamical variables, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, or AMO, uh, all the different flavors of the Nino indices, as well as the uh, intertropical convergence zone, the ITCC, for the past 2,000 years. So why, why do we use these particular variables? Uh, so they're hydroclimate focused, and they were the most skillfully reconstructed in tests that we did. So I know I get requests from people for additional variables. Um, and in this first case, uh, FIDA, I really wanted reconstructed variables that I could trust. Um, and so ones that weren't reconstructed as well, I just didn't include. Um, so I will talk about how I'm actually adding more variables because I get, I get a lot of requests for additional variables um, with the proviso that they're, they're probably not going to be as reconstructed as well as some of the others. Um, all right, so climate model we use is the CESM last uh, millennium ensemble where I bias corrected the climatology of the model, a very simple bias correction. Uh, why these particular model simulations? Because it's the largest collection of model data for the common era and the reconstruction method does better with a large number of ensemble members. So uh, it's basically just the fundamental statistical principle of the law of, uh, law of large numbers. So uh, the more you have, uh, usually the better it does uh, until your computer can't handle it anymore. Okay, so the what proxy data set do we use? We use the pages 2K uh, version two plus um, a collection done by Brighton Moser et al uh, of true ring widths. And so we have a lot of proxies. So they're showing the spatial uh, uh, distribution of these proxies by, by roughly three different types and also the temporal uh, distribution of these proxies. So roughly 3000 though uh, that number drops off in time. So why these particular proxies? Because it's their largest collection of clean proxy data that I could find. And by clean, I mean something that was easy to incorporate in, uh, in the framework. It was consistently, um, had consistent standardizations. Uh, there were easy to, um, to use. So I didn't have to go to individual uh, proxy um, papers and extract that data. They were, they were in databases that were coherent databases. So why so many proxies? Uh, that'll probably be uh, one of the first questions that might pop into your mind for those of you who do reconstructions. Uh, many people do reconstructions uh, over very large areas with far, far fewer proxies. So basically there are two different approaches when 
doing a climate reconstruction. So the, the first approach and really the dominant approach is to pre-screen the proxy data. And there are different ways of pre-screening this, different levels uh, of um, uh, criteria that, that people apply. And fundamentally, this is coming from a stance where the scientist says, I already know what useful information is, and I'm going to screen out uh, what I don't think is useful. So I, I'm going to presume that I already know what, what I need. Um, I'll also mention too that a lot of methods, uh, reconstruction methods, statistical reconstruction methods uh, will blow up, will statistically blow up. You'll get infinities without pre-screening the proxy data. So there's also a practical component to this as well. Uh, some of these methods are just not, um, not very robust and, and will actually blow up. So data simulation, you don't have to worry about that. Data simulation Bayesian methods will not blow up uh, if you have um, lightly screened or unscreened proxy data. So basically the second approach and the one that I used here for FIDA is that uh, I'm going to let the reconstruction method extract useful information. If my method isn't robust enough to pull out the meaningful information, then something's wrong with my method. That's, that's basically what I'm uh, my modus operandi here. I, I, I don't exactly know what's useful, what my motivating um, thing here is, uh, but I'm going to rely on my method to try to find that out. I'm not going to a priori um, say uh, what my criterion is for useful information. Um, but I, uh, so in both of these approaches, I don't mean to um, dismiss the first approach at all. Um, it's just uh, two different like fundamental approaches of, of how do you use proxy data and how do you um, uh, deal with it with your reconstruction method. Okay, so insofar as the proxy system models are concerned, these are statistical. So I spent a lot of time working on um, alternative proxy system models and, uh, and more complicated ones didn't give me better results. So I stuck with a uh, simple statistical univariate and bivariate regression over calibration period. And so if we think back to the data simulation equation, this is the HXB component. So the trees I did univariate regression with either temperature or PDSI on the assumption that trees are either are largely either temperature or moisture sensitive. So whatever had the highest R squared correlation uh, with either temperature or PDSI, that proxy, then it got modeled as either temperature or PDSI. Corals are bivariate with SSD and SSS. This is a proxy system model developed by Diane Thompson um, about 10 years ago. And uh, all the other proxies, so speleothems, uh, sediment cores, I only had a few sediment cores in this data set that are high resolution enough. So I was only using annual data here. Um, those were all univariate with temperature. So ice cores, speleothems, a few, couple sediments. Okay, so we're, let's look at some verification. So uh, for uh, FIDA, this is how FIDA compares for just a simple correlation analysis with the drought atlases for the past 500 years for PDSI. So the correlations here are very high. There is, I will note, uh, overlap between the proxy data sets. I did not compute how much overlap there is, uh, but insofar as the drought atlases are understood in the hydroclimate, paleoclimate world as basically the gold standard uh, PDSI reconstructions, we wanted to compare FIDA against that. Um, so basically, given these very high correlations over North America, Europe, less so in Asia and in um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you could, uh, in the places with very high correlations, say the United States, um, Central America, uh, it looks very, very much like the drought atlases. Um, in fact, in comparisons, uh, it's, you know, correlations of near 0.1, it's almost identical, uh, going back a very long time. Okay, so uh, other verifications so that we have for just to give you an example of kind of some of the verifications that we did, we have the reconstruction in red and uncertainty estimates, um, and then comparing with observations in black. So AMO, the ITCC for a particular location, particular region, Nino 3.4 index, and the spectral coherence for uh, the Nino 3.4 index compared to observations. Um, and so 
uh, we were fairly confident in a number of these, these variables. Some of the, the variables we constructed were uh, less skillfully reconstructed than, than what we're showing here. So if you actually go to the paper, there's, we have extensive um, uh, tables that, that list out skill scores for different variables in different time periods. So one question I often get to is, does FIDA just reproduce all the flaws of the underlying model? And the answer to that is no. So some of the flaws, yes, it does reproduce, but others, no. So, so anything that has a time history involved, uh, then it's really determined, the reconstruction is really determined because of how we're doing the reconstruction. Um, it's determined by the proxies. So the time history is controlled by that. So what I'm showing here is FIDA compared against observations and the uh, first column. And then the second column at FIDA compared to the underlying climate model that was used, CESM. And so uh, take, for example, if we look at the bottom here, the Nino 3.4 index. Um, if we compare, uh, if we're looking at the first one here at the bottom, uh, FIDA versus had ISST, so the bottom left, um, the, the, the power spectra uh, for FIDA and had ISST, given the uncertainties, are, is very similar. If you then compare and we note that the red lines in each of the rows are, are the same, so they're identical. Um, if we then compare that with the underlying model, CESM's um, ENSO, which is widely known to be too strong, um, it's we're talking at least two to an order of like two times up to maybe an order of magnitude stronger than what FIDA or the observations say. So there's this massive spectral peak in the Nino uh, indices in CSM that's not reflected in FIDA. So what FIDA does have that it inherits from CSM is the, uh, the spatial covariance. So when I did the bias correction, it did change the spatial covariance structure a little bit, uh, but you're really relying on the spatial covariance uh, for doing the reconstruction to inform non-local uh, locations. And so that's not, uh, there's not really a way of getting around that other than um, doing a more sophisticated bias correction or uh, using data simulation in a framework where you're only using observations, uh, which is possible, but also has its downsides. So uh, I'm working on a version two of FIDA, uh, even right now. And so what am I working on to improve? So one is the proxy network using more proxies, uh, particularly from South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, which were not well represented. Uh, Europe was, was okay uh, represented in, in FIDA, but South America, uh, South America was really limited to just along the Andes um, and uh, Asia and Africa uh, were, were more sparsely represented. So we're going to include more proxies there. Um, going to do a little more rigorous proxy screening. So um, really I, I want to be as hands-off as possible. Um, I'm only going to cut out uh, the proxies with the most noise, uh, not gonna have a really stringent because um, I found that the better that I create my proxy system models, the less need I have to screen the proxy data. Uh, so if I do a better job on the proxy system models, and I should note that the proxy system models um, I found are the most sensitive component of the reconstruction process. Uh, a good proxy system model is the difference between a reconstruction that's really good and a reconstruction that's just completely noise. Um, if I ha don't have my proxy system models uh, good enough, you will just get noise. Um, so there is a, um, you know, a, uh, uh, um, uh, a component here where if, we, if you screen the proxy data better or more stringently, you don't need as good of a proxy system model. There's a bit of a trade-off here, but they're, they're interrelated. Um, I'm going to use an improved model, a more sophisticated bias correction that I'm working on, and uh, an updated data simulation algorithm that takes uh, account of temporal covariance information. So from year to year, there's uh, temporal covariance, and I uh, want to take advantage of that information in the reconstruction. Um, and I think I will end there uh, and turn it over to Jason. Happy to take your questions at the end. Oh, uh, uh, thank you, Nathan, for that extremely clear and sort of comprehensive summary of the data assimilation process. So we'll move on to the second speaker now. Uh, please remember you can enter questions into the chat box and we'll have a 
Q&A session at the end. So our second speaker today is Jason Smerton. Uh, Jason's a Lamont Research Professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. He also holds appointments at Columbia University as an Earth Institute faculty member and as co-director of the undergraduate program in sustainable development. He received his BA in physics before completing a PhD in applied physics from the University of Michigan. And Jason's research focuses on climate variability and change during the past millennia and how past climates can help us understand future climate change. So with that, over to you, Jason. And you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> now you should be able to hear me. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, and it's great to see so many names, uh, familiar names in the participants list. It's been too long since we've all had a chance to get together. So uh, this is a, a small consolation, but hopefully maybe in Morocco, we'll all have a chance to cross paths again soon. Um, I wanna just use this slide to acknowledge uh, the many people who have worked on the uh, research I'm gonna to present to you. Of course, Nathan, he's given us a great introduction. Uh, Ernesto Tejedor, uh, who's a great postdoc at University of Albany working under Matias Villa. Uh, we've had the pleasure of collaborating with him through a prior uh, project through NSF. My colleagues at Lamont, now UCLA, Park Williams, Richard Seeger, and um, a graduate student that is working with Park and me, Ariana Barulu Clark, who's doing awesome work in South America. Also, lots of funding from NOAA, NSF. Um, I already mentioned our PIER project. All has been really important for. Um, for funding the research that I'm presenting. So I want to, my slide's gonna advance here. I have the, the privilege of showing you a few of the applications of FIDA. So the plan was to have Nathan give us this background on FIDA and then go through a couple examples. I've chosen these examples for two reasons. Um, one, their recent work uh, sort of hot off the presses uh, that we've completed with FIDA recently. But I also think there are two good examples of how we've used FIDA, how we've worked to validate what we're seeing through FIDA, and also how we've used FIDA to compare results to models to give us some insights into what the proxies um, suggest in these contexts and what models say in these contexts. And I think some of the discussions in some of these pages uh, seminars over the summer have been thinking about the past to future perspective that the common era paleo interval can provide. And I think that these model comparisons are one example of, of how we can use paleo data to inform model performance, to inform risk associated with uh, future changes and responses to things like volcanic eruption. So hopefully that'll come through in what I show you. So can everybody, I hope you can all see my laser pointer. Um, the first act that I wanna go through is this coupled mega drought story that we've investigated um, involving persistent multi-decadal scale droughts in the American Southwest and in Southwestern South America, namely Central Chile. Um, there's lots of reasons why we were interested in this. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of mega drought work, particularly over the medieval interval in Chile. Lots of um, current conditions driving interest in this. Of course, the ongoing mega drought in the American Southwest and the pro prolonged drought period that some people have been calling a mega drought in central Chile as well, with lots of agriculture and economic implications. So we have a paper on this led by Nathan coming out in Nature Geosciences um, soon, uh, but I'll give you a sneak peek in terms of what is in that uh, paper. When we started looking at this problem, of course, we went back to the original Stein paper. Uh, Nathan's already mentioned that. Some of you may not appreciate, this paper is, is certainly famous in the mega drought uh, community, um, but people, including myself, forget that it was a paper both about California, which is how we usually think of it, the mega droughts that Stein identified in the Ca California Sierra Nevadas, but Patagonia is also in the title. So this was actually uh, one of the first mega drought papers in general, uh, but also noted this connection between the droughts that uh, were being characterized in California and these droughts that were identified in lake records in, uh, in Patagonia and Southern South America. Interestingly, the, the explanation that Stein gave at the time was for a tightening of the polar circulation such that storm tracks um, move north in both hemispheres. Uh, for California, that would have meant those storm tracks moved 
north of California, bringing the droughts that were seen there. It was a little more complicated in Patagonia because you would actually move the storm tracks over this region, but Stein appealed to an enhanced rain shadow effect over that region. That's not been an explanation that's been, um, been pursued in detail since that time. Um, and a more contemporary understanding would look to the tropical Pacific as the controlling feature. Um, and so I'm also highlighting this paper that Ricardo Villalba and colleagues uh, published as a book chapter in 2011, which was the next paper and really one of the only few papers to talk about this in a hemispheric coupling of droughts across the Americas. Their focus was much more on the interannual time scale, but they were looking at tree ring records in central Chile and in the Bolivian Alt Altiplano, as well as the tree ring records from North America. What you're seeing in these arrows here are correlations first between the central Chile uh, tree ring records and the Manitol 2000 Nino 3 reconstruction, as well as the US Southwest showing these correlations with the tropical Pacific variability in SSDs, but also the correlations between the Southwestern trees and the central Chile trees, which they noted here um, to also exist. And so this was, I think, the first, and as far as we know, really one of the few uh, studies to look at paleo time scales in terms of drought coupling across these locations. It's important to note that uh, what uh, Ricardo and others looked at really went back just to the 17th century. So they really didn't get into the mega drought interval and their focus in this coherence plot was really on the interannual and ENSO peaks. So the discussion in the paper was really over these timescales, but in their coherence plot, this is the coherence between the central Chile uh, tree rings and ENSO, did see, you, 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 if you look back on their paper and they note it briefly, this multi-decadal coherence be, uh, peak that also existed, which we've ex expanded on uh, much more uh, in detail. This is also the correlation between those central Chile trees and the North American drought atlas. And you can see that there is this correlation. They're relatively weak, but it's also in, uh, it has a pattern that's sort of ENSO-like that you would expect if the connection was through the tropical Pacific. So this was the, the groundwork that was laid before we started looking at this in more detail, specifically over the mega drought interval. But if we pull these two regions out of the FIDA and we plot the average uh, PDSI from the FIDA over these two regions, uh, this is what you get. And I remember when Nathan first plotted this and I, I was really blown away at the degree to which these two regions um, vary, particularly at multi-decadal time scales in sync. Um, so just looking at these two time series, uh, I think you would, first of all, conclude that there seems to be a significant amount of co-variability and coherence across these two regions. If you actually co uh, calculate the coherence, um, so this is now periods out to about 150 years. This is the coherence. The gray line here is an AR null hypothesis. Uh, and so everything sitting above that would be considered significant against that null hypothesis. You can see some uh, significant coherence in the ENSO band extending into some of the multi-decadal timescales, and then this peak at the uh, multi-decadal to centennial timescales here as well. So uh, the coherence certainly tells the same story that you see by eye. We've done some other significance testing. So this is through uh, Monte Carlo bootstrapping experiments where we looked at um, the significance or the, the occurrence of multi-decadal drought periods uh, against an AR null hypothesis. And so the FIDA result are these asterisks here. The box plots are for the bootstrapping experiments. And the, the take home here is that you get more multi-decadal periods in drought uh, than you would expect by chance. Whereas if you don't have drought in either region, uh, that seems consistent with the null hypothesis. I should have also noted that the, the lines, the shaded lines in this plot are the multi-decadal periods, the most extreme multi-decadal periods that we've identified for both the North American Southwest and for Chile. And you can see that they're really concentrated through the medieval period. Uh, and there is an, a lot of overlap. So the periods where these lines are overlapping is when you have these extreme multi-decadal periods happening at the same time. So that was our initial uh, pass on this. I, I, I wanna step back. And one of the things that might be in the back of some of your minds is, well, within this data analysis uh, framework, how much can you get um, information, say, from North America bleeding into South America, et cetera? So we did, we did a few experiments, and I think this is an area where, you know, you get what gets spit out of FIDA, but I think there's additional um, assessment necessary when you're looking at applied problems like this. So what we're showing on the left 
is the Chilean time series. So that average uh, PDSI time series over central Chile from FIDA. And then what we did is threw out either all the proxies in North America or just the proxies in the North American Southwest. And you can see that the time series look very similar, certainly back to about 1400, maybe a little before that. There are some uh, intervals where the lines diverge in this earlier period where we have fewer proxies. But generally the take home there is that you can throw out all the North American proxies and get very similar results over this uh, region in Chile. Similarly, uh, we compared FIDA. So again, this is the FIDA average over the Chilean region. And then we just took the proxies over the same region and, and used uh, the pairwise comparison CPS approach. So it's just an index reconstruction method, but basically just took the proxies over Chile and did an index reconstruction over the region. And you can see again, uh, if you compare what you get under that experiment with what you get out of FIDA, the, the results are very similar. So this, this encouraged us to think that these uh, reconstructions results over Chile were very robust against method and different proxy selections. So now let's get to that question of why that Nathan brought up. And what I'm showing here is um, global composites of PDSI over land and SST over oceans from FIDA for the periods in which the North American Southwest is in mega drought, but not the uh, Chilean region. For periods when uh, Chile is in drought, but not the North American region. It can be in drought, but not in, in as we've defined these, um, these multi-decadal periods of drought. And then this lower right hand panel is the composite when you have drought in both Chile and North America. And then this lower left hand panel is when you have uh, when you don't have drought in either region. What you can see emerging as you sort of increase from the drought in individual regions of both region is this very strong La Nina IPO pattern that develops. So this very strong uh, pattern suggestive of La Nina controls on droughts in both regions and uh, very extreme La Ninas when you have droughts in occurring simultaneously in both regions versus El Nino conditions when you uh, don't have drought in either region. So that's our, our first suggestion about the dynamics here. But we've investigated that in more detail. So these are PDF subset analyses for um, all years, which is the dashed um, black line here. For neither year, and you can see that the PDF shifts more towards the El Nino conditions. And then for, for drought conditions, for mega drought conditions in just the North American Southwest, you have a shift toward La Nina conditions. And then for conditions of mega drought in both Chile or both regions, you see this strong La Nina shift in the PDF associated with um, the Nino 3-4 index uh, during these mega drought intervals. We've also done uh, self-organizing map analysis. And the way to do this or to interpret this, or these are eight modes of SOMs where you have four um, El Nino modes uh, associated with this analysis and four La Nina modes associated with uh, this SOM analysis. The numbers here, if they're colored and not gray, are significant increases or decreases in the occurrence of these patterns. So one of the things you can do with the SOM analysis is look at the best matching unit during any given year associated with one of these patterns. And so what we have looked at is the incidence of these patterns during the mega drought, uh, simultaneous mega droughts. And in the cases of the El Nino patterns, they reduce significantly during the simultaneous mega droughts. And in the cases of the La Nina patterns, we get significant over 100% increases in these very strong La Nina patterns, increases in all, some are not significant, but the story here is you get more uh, La Nina occurrences and very strong La Nina occurrences and reduced El Nino occurrences during these simultaneous mega droughts. I should note that we've done a lot of analyses specifically for the North American Southwest. And the story there has been that the mega drought occurrence is tied to um, increased occurrences of La Ninas over decadal periods. Not a change in the mean state, you just get more La Ninas uh, by chance than you do during other periods for those North American mega droughts. And that's really the story of what's going on here. It's not a mean state change, it's just that you get lots more of these strong La Ninas occurring during these mega drought periods than you do during other periods in the time series. So the last thing that we've done sort of in this causal connection analysis is to look at these multivariate regressions where we've, we've looked at uh, PDSI in the North American Southwest 
and we've regressed the Nino 3-4 index, the AMO index, uh, an estimate of the global radiative forcing. And the story in the North American Southwest is that these all contributed significantly, but uh, the Nino 3-4 is dominant. When we combine them all, we get the best uh, regression results assuming or applying an information criterion assessment so that we penalize uh, the regression for the additional predictors. But even in light of that adjustment, the best predictor for PDSI in the American uh, Southwest is for all of these with ENSO being the dominant factor. For Chile, um, you get a much stronger influence of the Nino 3-4 index, no Atlantic influence, a modest forcing influence, um, but that the occurrence of uh, drought conditions in Chile are strongly tied to um, the tropical Pacific. So all of this has been put together to um, essentially argue that the occurrence of these mega droughts simultaneously is driven through the tropical Pacific, primarily through um, La Nina occurrences in the tropical Pacific. So for this part of the talk, just a very quick summary. Uh, FIDA characterizes medieval mega droughts in central Chile, something that hadn't been uh, done to a large degree over this region. And they're similar to those, uh, they occur during periods similar to those occurring in the American Southwest. Um, these things have occurred simultaneously over the last millennium by an amount that exceeds expectations from chance alone. And um, their cause really appears to be primarily periods of frequent and extreme La Nina events um, that drive these simultaneous mega droughts. The last thing I wanna say about this topic is that we've done some preliminary results where we've looked at um, simultaneous uh, mega droughts in the CESM ensemble. And so this is the coherence between the Chile and North American Southwest regions for FIDA in red, for each of the ensemble members in these various colors, and then the AR null hypothesis. And I really want you to focus on the ensemble members. That's actually, in thinking about this, the CESM ensemble mean is not really what we wanna look at because that's more the coherence uh, driven through forcing in this uh, last millennium ensemble. But in terms of risk assessment, what I want you to, to note is that in CESM, the uh, coherence on the ENSO time, interannual timescales is much stronger in the CESM model. It does get simultaneous mega droughts, but it tends to be much more strongly coupled at the interannual timescales. And we think this has to do with what Nathan brought up earlier. You just have this big banging ENSO drum in CESM, which it's well known for. But then as you get out to these multi-decadal centennial timescales, um, FIDA is showing a, a stronger coherence in these timescales than what we see uh, from these individual ensemble members. And this is preliminary, but I would simply say that this is an example of where the proxy information might be suggesting that there's more risk associated with these simultaneous mega drought events than you would estimate from a model like CESM. We need to do this with lots more models and test this more, but it's a good example of where the proxies might be suggesting that there's more risk associated with these kinds of events than you would get from uh, simulations with the model. Okay, I wanna make sure that we have some time for questions. So I, I'm gonna blow through um, this second example, but this has been some really interesting work that Ernesto Tejedor and two papers that were published this year in PNP and PNAS on the um, volcanic responses in FIDA uh, due to large tropical volcanic eruptions. I'm just gonna very quickly show you what we mean by large tropical volcanic eruptions. Um, we, we only looked at the last thousand years. So that's this quadrant in this volcanic time series is the Siegel et al. 2015 uh, estimate. Um, we looked at only tropical volcanoes. So those are the green volcanoes in here and uh, only events larger than Pinatubo. So this line here is the magnitude of Pinatubo. So it's, it amounts to, we actually didn't do the selection from the Siegel. We, uh, uh, series we selected from the, two, the updated TUI and Siegel uh, results, but that yields 19 total events and 13 events when we control for double events. So you get events like the 1809-1850 event um, where you know there's, there's strong association in time. We would throw out this first event and only use the second event um, to try to control for the influence of an earlier volcano on what we're assessing. So we assess 13 events, um, I just wanna show you this quickly. This is the temperature response. And there's lots of different lines in here, but this is for the 13 events. 
The shading here is across the full CESM ensemble. The blue line in, in here is for the CESM ensemble member 10. We're interested in that ensemble member because it's the member that was used for the prior in the FIDA data assimilation product. Um, and then FIDA is in red. The LMR, uh, last the data analysis uh, product is in green. And then we're comparing it here for the Northern Hemisphere. The yellow line is the Schneider et al. Um, MXD. So only the density um, re temperature reconstruction for the Northern Hemisphere. And then this is the Wilson et al. Ntrend Ringwick plus MXD reconstruction. Um, you know, one of the things that blew my mind when we looked at this is FIDA includes a lot of Ringwick series, as, as Nace noted. But we're really in the ballpark here in terms of comparing against uh, the community's best estimate um, for controlling for biological persistence in the Schneider et al. Uh, density only reconstruction. And, and FIDA is looking pretty good in terms of how it compares with the other paleo products. As far as how it compares to the model, they're probably within the ensemble spread, but there is a little bit more persistence in what the model estimates relative to um, what the proxies are estimating. So the proxies are roughly the same uh, magnitude of response, but suggesting a more persistent response um, in the temperature response. I'm going to skip the next slide and just because I'm going to conclude on something that calls for this. this is the spatial, these are Hobmoller plot, plots of the cooling as a function of latitude and over 20 years post event. This is the fighter response and temperature. This is CESM ensemble, so it's the ensemble member 10 and the LMR. There are significant spatial differences in the cooling responses. So not just in the magnitude and the persistence, but uh, significant spatial differences. LMR has this cooling very concentrated in the polar northern latitudes. FIDA tends to be um, more concentrated in the extratropics and polar latitudes relative to CESM that estimates more cooling in the tropics. I have no idea why these differences exist. And I think there's a lot to be done here to understand this. FIDA and LMR are all based on the same proxies. They have different, slightly different model priors. LMR uses the CCSM4 uh, simulation and FIDA uses the CESM simulation. There are modest differences, but I think there's a lot to look at here in terms of the spatial differences in the volcanic cooling that these different products are estimating. Okay, so this is what I really wanted to get with regard to FIDA. There's a lot going on here, but this is the first global picture of proxy estimated hydroclimate responses due to volcanic events. So what you're seeing in the middle map on land is the PDSI average of the 20 years after uh, these volcanic eruptions. So this is the superimposed epoch analysis uh, average for the 20 years after each eruption, and then the SSTs over the ocean. These plots here are measures of the latitudinal shift in these uh, tropical boxes of the precipitation centroid. So if they're shifting to down, that's a southward shift basically in the precipitation centroid, which we interpret as an ITCZ shift to the south. So all of, and if they're in green, they're significant. What all of these plots are showing is essentially a southward shift of the ITCZ that's consistent with the, the PDSI patterns that you're seeing here. These are uh, SST changes in various modes of SSTs in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is that FIDA estimates fairly extreme and persistent hydroclimate changes over a decade to a decade or longer uh, on land relative to what we see with the model. Now I'm gonna to toggle forward to the CESM result. So this is the CESM result, same conditions, same events as estimated by Gao. There's a little bit of trickiness in terms of matching up the Gao et al. Uh, um, events that were used to force CESM with uh, the Siegel events that we use in FIDA. But, and we looked at that and, and it really doesn't make too much of a difference if you try to control for it. But as we toggle back and forth, the take home here in FIDA is that FIDA is estimating, first and foremost, more extreme hydroclimate anomalies due to volcanic events and more persistent hydroclimate anomalies than we see in the CESM response. And if you look over a region like South America, it's actually estimating 
uh, the opposite effect. So you see a strengthening in the South American monsoon region in Fida and a, a drying of the Southeastern South American region, whereas Fida estimates a weakening of the South American monsoon and a wetting over the CISA region. So lots to look at here, but this is another example of where the proxies are estimating more risk in different places associated with the hydroclimate responses to large volcanic eruptions, which independent of climate change are likely occur to occur at least sometime during this century based on the historical data. Um, that is very different in what the model is estimating. And um, you know, we've been looking at these problems in terms of the temperature responses in, in proxies and models, but I think this is really opening up um, an important area of investigation. Some people have looked at this in the drought atlases, um, but really need to look at the differences here and why they're occurring in the models versus uh, the proxies. And there's all kinds of reasons why that could exist that have to do with proxies uncertainties, uh, volcanic forcing uncertainties, how those forcings are implemented in models, structural uncertainties in models. There's a lot to look at. So the last thing I'll say is that I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna weigh in as FIDA being perfect here. So this is a comparison in the Northern hemisphere between FIDA, the drought atlases in the Northern hemisphere and what you've already seen in uh, the model for JJA because that's what we have the drought atlases for. If you start comparing these regions, there's similarities between what the drought atlases are estimating and what FIDA is estimating, but there's some big differences. So over, for instance, uh, Western and uh, Northern Europe, uh, you see drying in the outa, which is not the case in FIDA. So we have some, um, some uncertainties to work out there. What I will say, however, is in terms of the magnitude of the response and the persistence of the response, FIDA and the drought atlas st still agree in the sense that they're estimating larger hydroclimate responses to the volcanic events relative to what we're seeing in the CESM model. So, I want there to be time for questions. I think I've emphasized all of this. I, I probably didn't emphasize the fact that those coupled events are really important for looking at these SEAs uh, relative to the volcanoes. I think that's really important and people should look at it. We need to control for these events that occur close to each other, if there's particularly if there's more persistence. And I think there's lots of open questions about um, how FIDA, the other hydro analyses compare as well as the model analyses. And I'm just gonna make one last pitch that pages actually take this up. We have tons of products now, lots of things to look at, and uh, we should be doing intercomparison projects. If we think about all of the last, uh, the data assimilation products that have been developed over the last couple of years, um, I showed you comparisons between FIDA and LMR. We really need to be doing a better job now that all these products are coming out to looking at similarities and differences and what the underlying assumptions and methodological approaches are that are giving us similar or different responses. All right, I am going to try to get out of here. Stop sharing my screen so we can see everybody. And oh, thank you, Jason. Yeah, so thanks, Jason. So, I mean, you've clearly highlighted the enormous potential there to interrogate FIDA. So that's an incredible resource. And in terms of your proposal there at the end for a project, this is very relevant to the proposals being developed for a potential phase four of pages 2K, so, so please do engage with that process during the weeks ahead. So I think we do have time to squeeze in a couple of questions. So uh, I've got one here for, hang on a sec, yep, for Nathan. Uh, what's a good way of illustrating the reliability of different variables in space? Maybe maps of ensemble spread? Uh, yes, maybe I'll show a figure um real quick here so um one thing that that i'm working on for the new version of fida is um to uh try to have some estimate of uncertainties in time both space and time so i haven't found something that i'm super happy with but one possibility that i've been playing with is looking at how um, variance in the mean relates to uh, the spread in the ensemble and when, at what point is it the case that the spread becomes large relative to the variance. And so basically if you do this using one particular metric that uh, I admit is ad hoc and I uh, have had a very hard time trying to find if there are any kind of standard uh, methods for doing this, I, and I don't think there are, uh, but um, 
basically what you get then is maps like what I'm showing here for temperature and PDSI. And so the story that you get is that uh, there are certain locations that have very low uncertainties going back even 2000 years, but then there are other locations where um, the uncertainties are large, even in the 1800s. Oh. And, um, and the, the reconstruction is saying, yeah, the, the uncertainties are, are big here. So um, this is one area that, that I'm working on. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Uh, and a related question, uh, how does your method deal with the uneven distribution of data in both time and space and uh, how much uncertainty does that cause? Uh, so it's, it's quite natural. Uh, the, the, the methodological framework um, you know, doesn't need proxy data that's evenly distributed. So uh, what impact does that have? Um, it depends on the location and the uncertainties in the proxies. And so basically like that kind of map is, is partly one of my attempts at trying to estimate, okay, what is this influence? Um, uh, so I don't know if you happen to remember, but one of the, one of the areas that, that has very low uncertainties is, is the American Southwest, because there are a lot of really good proxies there. Um, and you have low uncertainties going all the way back to the beginning of the common era. Uh, but you know, pick somewhere else where you don't have as many proxies or the proxies aren't as good and the uncertainties are much yeah. larger. Nathan, I, I also just wanted to follow up on what you were saying with regard to the ensemble spread. And I want to, I want to appeal to a few people who are planning to use any data assimilation product in general. Please don't just use the ensemble mean um, because you do get eaten up by some of these variance losses if you're using that. We've found for a lot of these analyses that it makes a lot of sense to use um, a probabilistic ensemble uh, analysis that, that essentially looks across ensemble members and provides essentially uncertainties based on the ensemble spread for some of these events. And one of the things that I just want to alert everybody to is that Nathan's made available a hundred member ensemble from the FIDA at the Zanato data site. So you can actually, you can, and that's what we've done in a lot of these analyses. We've analyzed all hundred ensemble members and used that to give us a sort of probabilistic estimate and evaluation of the results that we're getting. Cool, thank you. 